Welcome back. Masa Expert Q&A with my wonderful co-host, Ashley Van Houten. What's up, Ash? Thanks, Ben. Can we talk really quickly about pronouncing our last names? Because remember, I was laughing about this the last time we chatted about how we both have last names that are somehow like impossible to pronounce by anybody, even though I think they're pretty straightforward. Like your last name is like, you have to just say it phonetically. Like, I don't know how else you'd say it other than Pakulski, right? Do you hear people say it something weird? Yeah. And I often question the literacy. Yeah. (laughs) Fair. (laughs) These are people who only text, so they never actually had to learn how to read, I guess. Yes. Oh, yeah, exactly. I, okay. yeah, I don't know. But okay. yeah, it, it's very phonetic. It's always been that way. It's never changed. And yet people have always screwed it up. It's very surprising. And what like nationality is it? Polish. My dad's Polish. Polish. Yeah. Okay. All right. So for the record, everybody, my name is not Alicia Van Houten. It's, <laughs> it's Ashley Van Houten. Van Houten, here's how you can remember. This is Dutch and O-U-T spells out. So it's Van Houten. And yes, my first name is spelled a little bit different. But if you just take two seconds to look at how it's spelled, you will see very clearly that it's Ashley. So there we go. We'll put those to rest once and for all. Ashley Van Houten, Ben Pakulski. Let's go. I appreciate you doing I that. I had to get it off my chest. I had to get it off my chest. It's done. I think that segment should become our next Instagram post. <laughs> Just that. Yeah. Okay. Impossible last names. Yeah. All right. I'm into it. Um, how's Columbia? It's really awesome. You know, you're effectively in a city that was cut out of the middle of the jungle. You got mount- you're surrounded by mountains and jungle. And it's really nice. I'm honestly kind of staying in my own little bubble because one – I don't have the confidence or the ability to speak the language to go out into the mountains and into the kind of the remote areas because I'm not so sure. But uh, downtown where we are in Medellin is absolutely phenomenal. We have this beautiful apartment. There's a huge yard and a huge deck and literally everything we need within walking distance. So it's been phenomenal. I spend way too much time at my computer, but I'm getting a lot done. It's really great. A lot of planning, a lot of executing, a lot of good stuff is going to come out at this time. And you know, objectively, I'm setting my year up next year so that I can spend a lot more time with my kids and not have to be at my computer all day, you know, building content, building businesses, and just trying to automate things. So that's cool. Goal. And what are you eating over there? What kind of food do they have in Colombia? Uh, so the food is phenomenal. Like I'm eating meat and veg every day. We, we found this amazing breakfast place where you get filet mignon. The food is so cheap. It's a fraction of what you would pay in the US or Canada. So, you know, every morning for breakfast, I have filet mignon with some sweet potato puree and avocado. Amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. And we have amazing coffee and, you know, dinner is usually like some type of seafood. I'll have octopus or or, uh, calamari. Sometimes we'll do some steak and and sometimes usually some veggies. I haven't got into too much of the red wine down here, which is nice. Mm. So I've been, yeah, just chilling. It's very humid there, right? Because you're like basically in the jungle. No, nope, humidity is zero. At the really? Same That's lucky. Okay. Yeah. So it's just like warm and beautiful, yeah. but not like crazy hot. Exactly. It's and perfect. tell me about the gym there that you're going to. Well, it's on the 15th or 16th floor and it's overlooking Medellin, which is absolutely beautiful. This wonderful city of clay colored buildings built into the mountains. It's just phenomenal. And you're looking out the window at these beautiful mountain ranges and it's majestic for sure. So the gym's okay. I mean, it gets the job done and, you know, it's not certainly not the worst gym I've ever been in, but as far as the view it is certainly nice. And there's a sauna, actually a steam room overlooking the mountains as well, which is awesome. So that's a nice bonus. That's the only gym I've been to so far. I'm, I'm kind of keeping my training tame, getting in there f- at least five times a week, sometimes more, getting a couple walks in. The training is tame and consistent. And because my nutrition is relatively minimal, like what the most I'm eating is twice wow. a day, training is pretty... Well, again, I'm sitting down a lot. I'm working a lot. So it doesn't make sense for me to be eating a lot. And to be honest, I'm here for a very particular reason. I'm here to automate my business so I can, one, have more passive revenue, two, spend more time with my kids, You know, two primary goals, and ultimately automate things so that I can bring on, as we talked about previously on the podcast, 10 mentorship clients based around, you know, people specific in the fitness industry who want to improve their skill set around getting a result for the clients and grow their client roster, grow their online business. So that'll be early next year. And it's going to be very exclusive. I mean, when we sent out that, I think we did one podcast and we said, hey, we might be doing this. We had, I don't know, I think we had well over a hundred people say, hey, I'm in. So there's going to have to be an application process because one, I don't want to take on too many to where I can't uh, give a really good result. So 
really small group, highly committed people who are into these. We're in alignment, right? Maybe we can help each other. Maybe we can have parallel views. And ultimately, I want to build people who are conveying the same messages, right? Let's all be talking the same language and sharing the same information and have the same beliefs and values so we can spread this word of intelligent muscle building. Cool. I have a sort of bigger question that I want to ask you about the work that you're doing over there, but there's a couple questions that came in from social media that are sort of quicker ones that I want to I want to get out of the way before we like deep dive on this other topic because I want to make sure that I'm not just like selfishly asking you the questions that I want to ask and that <laughs> we're answering some questions that other people are putting out there first. So, with that said, are you doing yoga while you're there in Colombia at all? Your own kind of thing? Yeah, three or four times a week I do it in my hotel or my Airbnb. Okay. Yeah. What are your thoughts on or do you have any in particular about – we're not talking about yoga now. We're just talking about stretching. Someone was asking about the importance or not importance of stretching either before or after a workout. And I'm assuming we're talking about sort of lifting and bodybuilding in this case. As far as its implication on your ability to build muscle or as far as your – Yeah, I think really performance. Like I think just in terms of like warming yeah. up your body to prep yourself for the movement and then your ability to kind of perform to you, the best of your ability when you're lifting. Sure. So we know, science knows that when we create a appreciable amount of muscle damage, so muscle soreness, that when that muscle regrows, it actually grows at a slightly shorter contractile length. So – Muscles ultimately, it's just internally becoming tighter. Now, the amount of change over time is is minute, but it is there. So you'll see people who really overdevelop their chest who kind of have that, you know, the shoulders roll forward. People who really develop their biceps, their elbows start to bend. And it's minute, but it's significant enough to where it's changing the muscle length and potentially predisposing you to injury. So the school of thought would be if I stretch this thing, maybe I can maintain this muscle's actual appropriate length. That may be the case. I don't actually know. What I would suggest may be more appropriate is improving the contractile ability of the muscles on the other side, which will then pull the muscle back. Because I think a muscle, you know, think of a muscle over time, muscle has like fascia interwoven, which is this connective tissue that's kind of like, you know, stuff you'd see wrapped around a chicken or like, like if you get a chicken breast, that like white sheath. And it's very strong. It's, the, you know, the tensile strength of steel. So it's this structural connective tissue that grows into a muscle. So if a muscle shortens and it the fascia starts to grow and it's going to stay that way. But if we have equal balance of muscle pulling on both ends, well, then the fascia kind of tends to develop in this way that's a little more balanced from both ends. So my suggestion is start paying attention when you're training to just like constantly looking and checking in with your body to see are things starting to move in one direction or the other. So if you know you see that your shoulders are starting to roll forward, whether it be because of your posture, because of shallow breathing, or because of overdevelopment of your chest, well, you should do everything in your power to kind of change the ratio of your training so that the training of the backside or the antagonist muscles is increased. So point being, I don't think stretching is going to change the contractile length of muscles. I could be wrong. Like I'm certainly not an expert in stretching. It may. There's been some people that would suggest maybe it is just allowing those myofibrils to kind of go back to their original length. And that would make a lot of sense. I mean, a lot of high level athletes for a long time have implemented stretching, saw improved mobility. So typically my belief is the lack of mobility or what people would call lack of flexibility is more often a result of lack of stability, right? We tend to sit so much and people start to become shaped like the chair, right? They start to round over their spine. They start to get really tight in their hips. So that is kind of the default. You go into just posterior pelvic tilt, which causes quote unquote tight hamstrings. And that's more a lack of stability than it is anything. So I don't honestly know how valuable stretching is to actually changing muscle length. But I think it's extremely valuable to the health of your nervous system, to improving parasympathetic tone. So stretching has been shown to be a relatively parasympathetic input. Maybe, again, I think this is also another subjective, improving blood flow. People think it improves blood flow. People think massaging improves blood flow, but that's been proven to not be true. So it's really interesting that stretching as a whole doesn't have a whole lot of substantiated research on what it actually does. But if it is going to do anything to sum this up, it'll be returning those myofibrils, which are either damaged, so they shorten and they tighten up, or damaged from training, so they shorten and tighten up, and returning those to their original contractile length, therefore potentially preventing that net default shortening of the muscle, which that would contribute to injuries. That, that makes make sense. sense. Got it. Cool. All right. On to the next one. This one I'm actually very interested in hearing from you about. This is asking about whether it's a thing 
body weight set point. Is that a thing? And how do you specifically manage body weight set point when you know you're Can somebody you explain what that is? Okay, body weight set point, my understanding based on the question is that there is this concept that all of us, when we're kind of grown adults, have a general set point that our body wants to sit at. So maybe sure, I of course, yeah, yeah. maybe I want to be 130 pounds. My body wants to be 130 pounds. I look better at 120. So I'm always kind of like eating a little bit less, doing a bit more cardio, whatever, to try to get to this point that I like, which is not naturally where my body wants to sit if I kind of just left it alone and didn't sort of work at it, right? So the question from this person is, do you believe that that's a thing? And do you believe that trying to go away from your set point, either by gaining a ton of weight or losing a ton of weight is going to be detrimental to you hormonally? And then to add to that, I know I'm asking a bunch of questions within questions, but for someone like you, who Arguably, you went way beyond what any natural weight would be for your frame, right? When you were a competitive bodybuilder. And you almost probably, because you were doing it for so long, like you never really maybe had an opportunity to be, I'm using air quotes here, like a normal size because you just never were. Like you were always a bodybuilder as you were sort of growing up and maturing. So do you think that that has had an effect on your health in any way? Do you think it does have an effect when people are constantly trying to fight what their body's sort of natural set point is? Well, absolutely. There's a natural set point, right? This is just your body is 100% of the time in a quest to maintain homeostasis. That's literally like the reality of life that we're constantly trying to push, right? So as someone who's trying to build muscle, the objective then is the reason I train is I want to subject my body to a stress. So training is a stress. And that stress hopefully causes some system in your body to adapt. So training stress can be a stress to the muscular system, which is the goal, or the nervous system, or the endocrine system, or you know, ultimately the ability to produce energy, so the metabolic system. So all those things can become, you know, quote unquote, hormetic stresses, short-term stresses that the body adapts to. So the body will adapt by transcribing new genes. So everything we do in life, whether it be you know running a marathon or I guess any athletic endeavor we do, the attempt is to shift us away from what our current homeostasis is and hopefully have some type of adaptation. So yes, there is absolutely a set point, but it's not fixed. Like the set point is your body's natural tendency to resort back to this fixed point, but it can absolutely be shifted with constant stress and stimulus, right? So we have, this is how we view everything in action. And this is a really good point for people to start to understand how they should view approaching, changing their body. This is something I teach to my coaching students. Picture your body in the center of a circle, And everything on the outside is just an external stimulus. It's just a stimuli that's in some way being imparted on your body to create a response. So nutrition is just a stimulus. It's just a signal. Training is just a signal. The lighting around you is a signal. The air you breathe is a signal. The water, the sleep, stress, these are all external signals, right? And this is how I frame the six pillars, right? They're all just external signals that are attempting or they are creating an internal response, right? And that's everything, right? So what are the six things we can do as human beings? And and if everybody's listening and you actually understand this, I'd write this down. You can move, you can breathe, you can eat, you can sleep, and you can think. Five things. So eat, move, breathe, think, and sleep. And the other thing that is a consideration is the sixth one is the environment in which you do all those. That's it. Those are the things we can impact, right? So that's the six pillars. That's the premise of the six pillars. So how do I influence all those things? And those are all the things that are impacting my homeostasis. So if I shift the way that I breathe and I do it over time, consciously, eventually it becomes unconscious. When it becomes unconscious, my homeostasis is shifted. So this conscious attempt to shift my homeostasis is life. So if I'm training and I'm trying to create, let's say I'm trying to build my back. Well, in the beginning, when I'm trying to build my back, I have to be very conscious of what I'm doing to make my back muscles train harder. When that becomes unconscious, that will become my new set point. Right. So if I'm trying to put on 10 pounds or lose 10 pounds in the beginning, it has to be very, very conscious. I have to shift this homeostatic set point so that it's now shifted to the left or to the right or forward, back, whatever, to match my objective. And once it's shifted, it's going to be more likely to stay in that point. 
So yes, I do believe in it. What was the next part of the question? So I guess my question was specifically for you. Like I would assume that your natural set point was not 300 pounds, but you were around there for a long time while you were competing. So how did that affect your body adding that much weight? And then when you retired and you like sort of naturally obviously kind of came down a fair bit, like were there any sort of issues with that? Because at that point, maybe your set point was so much heavier than it was quote unquote naturally supposed to be. Yeah, I think... Certainly, my set point is higher than genetically meant to be. It seems as though your body has completely regenerated or replaced every cell every six months. So, if you're going to completely shift your set point, it's going to take a minimum of six months. I haven't seen a massive issue. Like, obviously, my habits are more of an issue than my set point. Meaning, you know, for a long time as a pro bodybuilder, I had to eat. Like, you, I think you made a post about this the other day. Like, imagine eating a Thanksgiving dinner six times a day for 20 years. That was my mm-hmm. life. So. That became a default. And that's, I mean, people don't realize how hard it is to gain that much weight and how much you have to eat to maintain that much muscle and maintain that much exercise. It's a lot. It's crazy. So that kind of became my genetic default. I used to walk around comfortably at 290 pounds with 4% body fat, right? Like 5% body fat. I was comfortable there. And people were like, how do you feel? I'm like, I feel amazing. I can run, I can jump, I can breathe, I can do everything, right? I didn't have an issue because that became my set point because that was my set point for so long. So now my set point is probably in the range of like 250, 260 and I feel comfortable here. But, you know, ask me in two years and it'll probably be 225, 230 and I'll feel comfortable there. It's just this constant progression. And I don't want to realizing that any shift in either direction is a massive stress, right? If I lose 100 pounds of muscle at once, which is originally my goal, but I lost probably 30 or 40 pounds and I was like, man, you know, I don't feel great. Like I feel kind of lethargic. So being in that much of a caloric deficit for so long, my testosterone was in the toilet. You know, my energy was crappy. My vitamin mineral profiles were in the toilet. My stress hormones were in, in the sky. So like you have to kind of do it in this ebb and flow way. So if I'm trying to build 100 pounds of muscle, lose 100 pounds of muscle, it has to be done over probably five to seven years. Like that's just the reality because otherwise the only way – I could do it. There's no question I could do it. But my testosterone would be zero and my cortisol would be a 1,000 and I would feel like shit and probably be angry and be eliciting disease in my body, right? This is not what I'm after. So it kind of goes against everything that I now know or that I've always known. I just had this great idea like, hey, I want to do this fast and then you know, thinking it through you know, mentorship calls like, no dummy, that's not a good idea. So – yeah. So I guess to answer the questions, yes, it is still affecting me, but I'm okay with that because I'm aware of it. I know what, what I'm trying to do and I'm trying to do it in a healthy way. Yeah. Okay. Last part of this question. And I know that probably the answer again is just like, you have to be consistent. You have to be intelligent and thoughtful with your training and your diet and you have to make sure you're doing it right. But my question is for somebody who maybe has felt like they're always struggling against their set point. So for most women, it's like, I wish I was 10 pounds leaner than I am. Like I wish I had 10 pounds less fat. And for dudes, it's usually like, I wish I had a couple extra pounds of muscle, whatever. And you feel like you're constantly trying to fight against this place where your body wants to be. At what point do you just kind of maybe weigh your pros and cons and say the stress and the mental and physical stress this is causing me isn't worth it? Or is it just a matter of you not having the right plan? Like, is there ever a a case where like maybe your body's telling you something and you just need to let it go. Maybe you weren't meant to be 10 pounds leaner. Maybe you weren't meant to be more muscular. Like where do you draw the line between I'm just trying to improve myself and look good naked and this is unhealthy for me now? Wow, geez, that's such a situational thing, right? I don't have the answer to that question. Yeah, it's definitely something that would have to be person by person and Hmm. I think if it's becoming a stress, I mean, you just kind of said it there, right? If it's becoming a stress, it can't be a good thing. So it needs to be something that you kind of let go of for a while. You let your body come back because anytime your body's listing stress, you're literally changing your brain or changing your body is an impossibility, right? So if we're in this massive sympathetic state, your body kind of, you know, the hippocampus becomes shrunken and you literally can't make changes to the brain or to the body. So, you know, we make the greatest amount of change when we are in a calm, relaxed state. Our, our brains can learn, our nervous systems are kind of more receptive to learning and they're more pliable. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I'd also just kind of finish up just from a woman's perspective. Cause I, again, I deal with so many just anecdotally or friends or people in the bodybuilding industry who are like, Oh, I did one bodybuilding show and then I didn't have a period for two years. And now I have my metabolism is messed, whatever. Like people have very long standing issues after dieting down to a place that was unhealthy for them. And I think, again, it just goes back to, yeah, certainly some people should never do this, but many of us are just too impatient and we do things in too much of an extreme way that causes our hormones and our cortisol and our stress and everything to go out of whack, which, you know, has longstanding repercussions. Do it consistently, slow and steady. 
there's also something really interesting to be kind of talked about here, Ash, is your perspective on whether or not it's going to be hard or easy mm-hmm. will be the reality. So most people go, ah, I'm really struggling to lose this last 10 pounds. Ooh, okay. So guess what you just did? You just completely shifted your hormonal response, your psychological response to that outcome, right? Yeah. Whereas, and that's a reality. This isn't me talking woo-woo stuff, right? This is like neuroscience. And, and again, we'll bring Dr. Huberman on as often as we can to to talk about this stuff. If anyone doesn't follow Dr. Andrew Huberman, go do it now. He's the brightest guy in neuroscience that I've come across and he articulates it in such a way that's just amazing and easy to understand. But, you know, literally like creating this negative belief is destroying your ability to change psychologically and physically, right? Based for hormonally. So there's certainly something to be thought about there where if you've struggled with this for a long time, let it go for a while. Let it go. Come back to it later. Change your perspective and go, hey, I can do this now. Like I can do this. I can do anything. And that's where these little micro wins come in. I posted about this yesterday on Instagram or, or I guess depending when this podcast comes out recently on Instagram. You know, every morning I make these kind of micro commitments and it's like, you know, everyone talks about New Year's resolutions and a resolution could be something as simple as, hey, I resolve to get into a cold shower and stay under the water for 60 seconds without moving. And it's very easy to not do. I, I resolve this morning to do 60 60 seconds of breathing or 10 minutes of breathing. I resolve this morning to get up and do my gratitude or these micro resolutions is a really important way to start gaining one, a neurological adaptation in your brain, but two, the psychological belief that you can, right? These micro incremental wins is how you change yourself. It's how you change your brain, how you change your body, how you change your life. Uh, It's always about the minutia. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. I 100% attribute my success in bodybuilding to my attitude about the process. I loved every minute of it. I thought it was fun. Every day when I woke up and saw changes or I got to make adjustments or I saw my body changing and I saw what I was capable of, I loved every minute of it. I loved every hard part of it. And I had so much less stress and so much less stress going on stage. And that comes out like, I mean, that's, it's all about your attitude. It's all about your approach to things. I had a bit of a reputation as a young bodybuilder for being arrogant and it, I just would go around and say like, yeah, well, it's okay because I'm going to whoop your ass. And it was just my belief. <laughs> like, yep. is it arrogant? Maybe. Maybe that's the reason I was successful. Like, I had no doubt in my mind that whoever was going to stand beside me, I'm going to crush you. Like, you don't stand a chance because you're not going to be willing to do what I'm willing to do. And that psychological win. Actually, I think Dr. Huberman was just talking about this, which was so, so interesting. Again, I wish I remembered what it was, but there was a study that they just did that showed that, gosh, what was the exact study? It was to the effect of if people actually believe they're going to win, they did 100% of the time, but they actually had to believe it rather than like just saying that they believed it. Yeah. You know, they actually... Right. So, and there was a study done. Again, he just posted it. So, we'll link it in the show notes. I can't, gosh, I wish I remember what it was, but it was like these people who had the belief that they're going to win going in won 100% of the time in this very particular subset of people doing this very particular subset of things. Again, I shouldn't quote it. Maybe next time we could talk about it or I'll definitely yeah. link it in the show notes. But super interesting stuff is just this belief. And, you know, we talk about arrogance and egocentricity. Is it, or is it just like, hey, I just know, like, I just knew that I couldn't lose going into those shows or I just knew what I was going to do. And the times when I didn't know, I didn't win. I didn't place well, you know, like 100% of the time. That's so interesting. Yeah. The difference between arrogance and confidence, we could go down a tangent on this one because I've talked about this before. And I think this is like a gendered thing too, because women have to be extra like hyper concerned about any time they, or they feel that any time they like act with confidence, that they're immediately worried that people are going to think they're cocky or they're a bitch or they're stuck up or whatever. The difference between arrogance and confidence is very straightforward. If you're confident, whatever you say, you can back it up. That's not arrogance because that's you actually fact believe that point. it. Yeah, but it's yeah. actually a fact. Like if I say like I wrote a really good book and I published it and it was successful, that's not me showing off. That's me telling you a fact that happened. You know what I mean? Like that's the difference. If somebody who didn't earn anything walks around saying I'm the shit, I do this and I do that, and it's not true, true that's arrogance. So there's a lot of subjectivity to that though, right? Where I think the reality is is like if I'm going through life and having all of these micro victories, these little micro wins, like, hey, I did everything I could today. I worked as hard as I could in the gym. I was perfect on my diet. And I have these psychological victories. Then my belief going into the final event or my belief at the end of it all is literal like, 
wow, I'm on top of the world. I'm so confident and so empowered because I did everything I needed to do. Same way with writing a book, right? Is if you're doing everything you possibly can, like I did all the research, I rewrote every chapter twice and like everything I just, I did I put everything into this. I'm absolutely confident that this is going to deliver a great result. That delivers that certainty. And people who have the difference between arrogance and confidence, like you say, is some people try to portray it. It's the idea of the secret, which I think is nonsense. Yeah, like it, fake it till you make it. Right. No, yeah. right. No. The only true belief comes from micro victories and, and actually believing at your core, like losing is not even an option. Like yeah. I didn't even think about losing. I didn't even think about the fact that I wouldn't go to the Mr. Olympia. I never thought about it. It never crossed my mind. And people go to your area. I'm like, no, I was just willing to do everything that you weren't. Right. Yep. People are like, oh, like, I was willing to do whatever it took. And I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was going to be on that stage whatever it took, just like you're going to write a book and you're going to go, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to write the best book that anyone's ever seen. And if it takes you, re- like Jordan Peterson, if you've seen him speak live, talks about when he wrote Maps of Meaning, he wrote every single line in that book 15 times. He said he went back and wrote every single line at least 15 times. So he knew he had it correct. And I was like, Imagine how empowering that is to a human being. He wouldn't put that shit out knowing that it wasn't perfect. That's why I believe his career took off is because he was so confident in his ability to deliver this message after that book was done. Nobody could talk to that guy. He goes, I wrote that thing 15 times. I thought so deeply about every single line in that book that I could talk to anyone on any topic with respect to that book. That's so empowering to a human being, right? And who's willing to do that? When I heard that, I was like, how can I not read this book? Like if one of the smartest men in the world that I respect on a different level is willing to do that, I'm like, I think every human being in the world should go out and read this book just to think of like, who's ever done anything 15 times, let alone an 800 page book written every line that many times. He said it took like X number of years to do it. I'm like, that's just insane. That's where confidence comes from. Like, that's what I feel like I was in bodybuilding, right? Like I did every single thing, you know, I did every single exercise thousands and thousands and thousands of times and reps and every, you know, every little detail thousands of times. I love that and agree with it completely. Okay. Moving on to one bigger question that I want to talk about before I let you go back into the jungle until next week is this is actually the healthy habit that we discussed offline that we wanted to talk about this week. And that is the importance of creating a grand vision for yourself. And I think that that's something that you're kind of working on right now personally in Colombia. So I'd love for you to kind of talk about what that means to you. Yeah. I think we talked about it briefly on a couple other Q and A's, but just this idea of most most people meandering through life, seeing, you know, metaphorically two feet in front of their face, if they're lucky. And they're so focused on, you know, these really, really superficial, acute things, acute goals. Like, what am I going to eat for lunch today? What am I going to eat for dinner today? Am I going to pay my bills at the end of this week? And that's where most people live. And that's a very, very disempowering place to come at your life. If you want to to live your greatest life, like we talk about a lot, having a grand vision to allow you to make decisions based on big picture, long-term goals is the only way to pursue that. I can't always succumb to short-term gratification and expect to get ahead in life. So having this big picture, this 25-year vista like we spoke about is vital to allowing me to avoid short-term setbacks, uh, avoid short-term distraction, and vehemently pursue my long-term goal. So that's literally what I'm doing, sitting here and going, what the hell do I want to do with myself? I see, again, this is you know maybe my ignorance or maybe my arrogance. Like I see the world as an endless opportunity for me and for most people, right? For everyone else. And I'm sitting here going, wow, what can I do? to make the greatest impact on the world. Like, how can I leave my mark on this rock, right? So I'm sitting here going, okay, for me to think on this grand level, I need to disconnect. I need to unplug. I need to spend time by myself. I need to spend time in contemplation and meditation and just go, what is my gift to the world? What am I really, really good at that nobody else can do? And what is my dharma, the thing that really fills my soul that I would do for free? And get up every day at 4.30 in the morning and, you know, jump out of bed with a smile on my face, voraciously voraciously attacking the day. There's only one thing, right? And this is what most people never get the opportunity to explore because they're too busy looking at that thing that's two feet in front of their face. So, for all the listeners out there, like, 
again, I know it's not easy because we all have things, right? So this society that we live in was constructed to keep us asleep, to keep us from questioning life, to keep us from having these grandiose missions, right? It's meant to keep people as factory workers living inside the box. And I hope that everybody in the, listening to this podcast understands that. And the only way you're going to change is if you start to question all the bullshit in your life, all the things you think you need, all the things that make you keep up with your friends and keep up with the Joneses and the cars and the trinkets and the shoes. It's all fucking bullshit meant to distract you. Television, Instagram, it's all bullshit that's meant to distract you. So if you're always constantly doing something, you can't think of anything big picture. You can't think of any long term. So you're always going to be chasing the acute nonsense. So you have to take time. You have to take control of your time, step back and go, okay, what do I actually want to do with myself that's going to impact the world in the greatest way possible? Because here's the reality. Nobody wants you to impact the world. No, none of the authorities want you to do things that are going to change the world. They want everyone exactly where they are, consuming things, barely scraping by, barely being able to pay the bills, thinking about being social and being having fun and then dying. That's where the authorities want you to be. If you actually want to change the world, you have to be willing to step out of the box and go, okay, I'm going to change this rock. What are we going to do about it and how are we going to do it and who am I going to collaborate with, right? So first it's like, what's my mission? And then who can I connect with that has a powerful energy, has a powerful mission like I do with parallel values? So that's where I'm going in 2020 to answer your question is I'm building a collective of people who want to make an impact, people who really want to change the world and not from a financial perspective, right? Finances will come to us because if we ultimately are least like Elon Musk, Elon Musk goes, hey, everybody, I'm taking you to Mars. And everyone, you know, most people are like, this guy's out of his fucking mind. But there's 100 or 50 or 1,000 people who go, yeah, let's do that. And those people have skill sets and they're all going to contribute to that mission. And now we have rockets that land themselves. And like, if you would have asked five years ago, like, no way, this guy's out of his mind. But guess what? We did it because he had such a lofty, grandiose mission and he made it known to the public. And we had people who had the same parallel visions and values and now we made it happen. And this is how we changed the world, right? So Elon Musk is just the one who's bold enough to make that statement and say, come out in public and say, hey, I can do this. We can do this. I don't know how. I don't know how to make a fucking rocket, but I'm going to put all the people together to do it. That's ultimately how we're going to change this world. Ash. So that's my 2020 mission is to start putting together the rocket putting together the oh, Avengers no. and the people who are very serious about <laughs> uh, like doing something to change the direction of the world. Can I be an Avenger? I'm going to come up with a cool name and a cool outfit and then you can judge accordingly. Does that sound good? <laughs> You're supposed I'm, to I'm, laugh now, Ben. Come on. I'm going I'm I'm to refrain from my I'm inappropriate really comments. I'm trying really hard here. <laughs> Actually, speaking of inappropriate comments, I was just about to ask you, can you guess what I'm wearing? And I'm going to answer it for you so you don't have to say anything inappropriate. The thing that I'm wearing right now is my brand new Blue Blocks glasses, which I bought using the discount that you offered because I just want to dial this back here. So when we were together in Tampa, you were wearing your glasses, which I never see you wear glasses. So I don't know if you need to wear them or if you just kind of only wear them sometimes or whatever. And they were really nice looking glasses. And it wasn't until I commented on them that you told me that those were blue blocking glasses. And I'm like, those are the first ones I've ever seen that weren't super nerdy looking. Like, no offense. I don't want to wear Dave Asprey like glasses like they look nerdy like you go to paleo fx and everyone's wandering around with their like orange glasses on and they just aren't cute so i was like those are actually nice and then fast forward now you know you're working with um blue blocks and yeah. they're like so, these amazing I, yeah. glasses anyway guess, <laughs> guess what i'm wearing Only glasses so <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah hey guys i probably purchased i certainly purchased four five companies with my own money to kind of see which ones I liked. I liked yep. a couple of them, but Blue Box was really next level. Blue Box is like aesthetically the best that exists. And as far as quality, from what I've seen, the best that exists. There's certainly a couple that may be on par, yep. but none that have both the quality of lens and the aesthetic. And uh, so I bought them for not only myself, my kids. And because I told you my kids won't be allowed to watch television unless they're using Blue Blockers. Right. And they know that now. So anything, if the sun's down and they want to watch TV on the weekend, Blue blocker's got to be on. So I just value their sleep and their brain so much that I think it's just a necessity. So I went and bought them and the kids actually like them. So I bought them a couple of them past. I'm not going to throw me under the bus. I bought some other ones off of um, some of the kind of main sites that have the kids ones. And the kids hated them. Like they hurt my head. They hurt my face. Like I'm like, okay. And we bought these blue block mm. ones and they like them. They have really cute little ones for kids. Like my daughter's got some pink ones and my son's got some blue ones. And 
And then I got those kind of tortoise shell, I think. And then I got some yellows and I got some reds as well. And the reds are really, really good. Like they're dark. They block out effectively all blue. And that's what you need to do. And I think you reached out yeah. for us, reached out to Andy and said, hey, like, can we get you on the show and talk about this? And he was a wealth of information. And then we created a relationship. So let's give everybody a, a benefit to kind of get that kickback. So we're hooking you guys up. 15% off blue blocks. Do you know the code, Ash? Is it muscle? Yeah, it's muscle, obviously. And there's also a dedicated link. We'll put that in the show notes. It's blue blocks and that's blu.com forward slash muscle intelligence. And if people want to go back and listen to that episode, sure. because this isn't like an advertisement. I mean, it is, but like the episode isn't an advertisement for blue blocks. It's Andy, who is super knowledgeable about light and the effects of light on health. So if you want to go back to that, that's episode 68. And we'll put that in the show notes too, so people can check it out. Sweet. I want to finish with my Christmas hack because you know Ben likes to have tangents. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to sound like Scrooge, but I'm pretty anti-Christmas. I fucking hate lights and I hate the materialism that's become a, the Christmas reality in North America. I don't want to speak for the rest of the world, but I hate Christmas. I don't hate- We all remember how you feel about Halloween too. And the well, <laughs> remember we had it. that conversation? We had a Halloween rant too. Well, it's in line with what I just said. Is this fitting inside this box? Is, most people are just zombies, right? We're asleep and we're just conforming to what people want us to be. Like Christmas is completely a- holiday that's been turned from something that was meant to be meaningful into something that's meant to just consume and, and drive merchandise purchase. Anyways, yep. so I considered, Danny Vega and I considered taking our kids away for Christmas and be like, hey, you know what? We're not going to do great gifts this year. We're going to get you one or two things and we're going to kind of give everything, give all this money to you know the homeless or give it to people who need it or buy gifts for people that need it and or we're going to go on our way on vacation and take the money we would have spent on gifts and do that. My kids were like, well, daddy, we, we want gifts. And I was like, you know what? To see the joy in their face is priceless. Like I don't want to be Scrooge for Christmas and I love giving gifts. I just hate the idea of them expecting gifts. I don't want Christmas to be about gifts. So what I've done is, so we've got 15 days to Christmas now. So whenever this podcast goes out, hopefully people still have some time to do it. But for kids who kind of don't yet understand, for people who have kids who don't yet understand the value or like the actual meaning of Christmas to give and to receive love and to be with your family and to ultimately just have an opportunity to relax and be alone with your family, and your loved ones. What I've done is for the last 15 days before Christmas, my kids are each going to have to go out and do one act of kindness to 15 different people. So you can't do the same person. They can't do the same thing. So they have to do a new act of kindness to a different person every day for the last 15 days. And they have to write it down. They're going to leave that for Santa Claus. So rather than leaving them cookies and milk, they're going to leave him their act of kindness. So we're calling it the 15 days of Christmas acts of kindness. And it can be family. It can be friends. It can be school. It can be any random person we don't know. It has to be something new. It has to be significant enough that that person knows. So my kids are leaving a list. So I'd love for all of our listeners to join in for these 15 acts of kindness you know, the mission behind like, hey, let's actually help people. Let's actually make the world a better place in Christmas rather than just going out and spending our paychecks on nonsense that we don't need and driving economy. I get there's value in driving economy, but at the same time, I think letting children understand that it's about becoming great people. It's about connecting with the people you love and ultimately bringing joy, which is, I think, maybe the original intent of Christmas. And then the materialism is kind of taken over, but I'd love to have everyone join us. So, we would appreciate that. And if you guys want to tag me on Instagram just to kind of see your behind the mission, I would love it. And even if you don't have kids, you know, like do it yourself. Go out and do one thing every day that's going out of your way. It's not just like, hey, I held the door for somebody or, hey, I give, you know, someone on the street two bucks. Like do something that's significant, you know, make somebody's day, change their life, something significant. Let's all make the world a better place. And I'll be posting that stuff over on social media as well. On Instagram is BPAC Fitness. Twitter is IFBB Ben Pack and Ashley at the Muscle Maven. Uh, are you on Twitter, yep. Ash? No, I gave up. I only have so much time for, for social media channels, so I'm sticking with uh, Instagram for now. But yeah. I love that idea. That is such parenting goals and so inspiring for like I'm sitting here thinking like I am an asshole. Like I should be doing this. Like, And it's not hard. Like you said, I mean, it's more than maybe just holding a door open, but like it's really not that hard to make someone's day. It's not that hard to do like a little extra step that's going to have such an impact on somebody. And then that carries over because who knows how they're going to feel and what they're going to do for somebody else. And, you know, going back to what you said, like there's nothing wrong with buying presents for your kids, but I think that making that the focus and the only thing is what makes it hollow. Like if you're spending time with your family and you're encouraging people to make other people happy and do good things for other people. And then also, Hey, here's a present that you really wanted. And that's great. Let's enjoy that too. I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me. I think that's amazing. Thanks Ash. And I just came up with that on the spot a couple of days ago. So I thought that was 
you know, again, I don't want to be Scrooge and I don't want my kids to not have Christmas, but at the same time, giving them the valuable lessons they need to become thoughtful, caring humans is important. And that's a wrap, ladies and gents, for another episode of the Q&A with Ashley, the Muscle Maven, and myself. We truly appreciate you guys being here. You know, our mission is huge. It's a big one. And we want to empower each and every one of you to know that you can build the body that you love, that you can love your life, that you should be giving love, that you should be grateful for everything you have. And let's spread that message of kindness and love and jacked biceps around the world. Have a great day, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.